Hello. My name's Charles Ringer. I've been a self-taught artist my entire life. I grew up in uh, rural Minnesota and was surrounded by nature all the time. And when I was a very young child, I was absolutely amazed by the physics and the geometrics in nature. It was everywhere. It followed me around like a plague, basically. <laughs> After high school, I went to the University of Colorado for about a year. I met my wife, Emily, and uh, we, well, I didn't really like the education system, so we had, I decided I would try something else. So we moved to California and got married, and uh, I decided it was time to get off the yellow brick road a little bit. And uh, so we decided, well, let's build a truck that we can live in and a trailer that was my studio space. And uh, we lived like that for, well, about three years, traveling around with a cat. We'd go north when it got hot and south with it when it got cold. That was my studio, pretty small. And uh, traveling around like that, we discovered there were all sorts of very interesting characters all over the country. And we would meet them and, you know, have a relationship with them for a while before we moved on. And uh, my style of work at the time was doing little figure sculptures that were like drop at a time off a welding rod, little bits of sheet metal and uh, wire and things like that, uh, as in this type of work. And very intricate uh, showed the characters that we met along the way. And over the years, I probably did a couple hundred of them. Another version here. And they were a little cartoony, but uh, you know, I'd never seen anything quite like them, so I don't know. I figure I'm just the medium for this kind of work. I get these ideas. I go from a mental state to a uh, physical state with it, which is quite a trick. After a while, we decided uh, that it was time to have a home base. So we happened to be in Montana at the time, and we were driving through Joliet, where we've been for 45 years now, and uh, saw a for sa sale sign in a junkyard and decided, wow, that looks good. <laughs> Maybe we'll have a bathroom and a shower after three years. <laughs> but anyhow, so we took on the task of basically cleaning up a toxic waste site and cutting all those cars up piece at a time and uh, transferring the uh, yard into like a nice living space and gardens. And uh, I had uh, a much nicer shop. And even having like a, uh, oh, a gallery space, of course. And then a getaway space, which is pretty important for me to, you know, all that urban stuff up front. I can go to my backyard and kind of just melt off into the ozone since I'm a pretty good daydreamer. Um, my talk is basically going to be about the process of creativity through the trial and error method. And so this, I didn't really have any education in this. It was just kind of a natural instinct. And I think everybody has it. Everybody had to be creative many years ago. Otherwise, you did not survive. And it's a natural instinct in everybody. And I found a way that really works for me uh, to, you know, a lot of people say, I can't get motivated, whatever. Well, you know, I think it starts in a process where first you have curiosity. And uh, it, it 
gets you interested in something. It catches your attention. You're looking at it. You're, you know, and pretty soon the next step is observation. And so you're really studying this thing now. And it, you're starting a game plan with it. You know, how am I going to approach this personally? And the next step is motivation, which sometimes is hard. But with these first two processes, you don't even know what happened. You're up and in it, you know, before you even know. You're dragged to it just about. It's like magnetism. And then you get into experimentation. And through that experimentation, you find all sorts of things. You take it apart. You try to put it back together. Maybe it doesn't fit, whatever. Doesn't really matter, but you're experimenting. And <clears throat> through that experimentation, you're getting results. And those results, you're not really sure what to do with, but you need to put those in an area that you have access to, that you can come back to. A lot of this, for me, I mean, you, you have a goal. And you think, well, that's where I need to go. And not necessarily. Uh, maybe you need to pay bills or something. You actually have to get to the goal and sell that product, whatever. But for me, once I'm motivated and I'm t headed towards the goal, I see so many different directions I can go. Maybe midway, wherever. There are dozens of different directions to go. And some of those are strong enough that you just go that way and you completely forget the goal. And it's an important thing to be able to do that. Sometimes you don't have the luxury, but a lot of times what you really want to do has no connection with what you thought you were going to do. It's kind of like having stepping stones in the fog where you can't really see ahead of you very far, but as you motivate, the next steps become clear. And it's a process. It's like a wheel. You progress. You're going somewhere. You're evolving. It's a very critical part of that. And so, you know, along the road, you're going to have an enormous amount of failure. And uh, you really know, you have to need, know how to deal with that. And for me, I take a failure and I channel my anger or emotion or whatever is involved with that back into my process. It goes back into curiosity. I go, well, what? And then uh, observation, you study it and you go, hmm. Pretty soon you're motivated. Pretty soon you're experimenting again. And now you have new results because you've taken this thing apart. You've found out what's wrong. And you fix it. Or at least you know what not to do next time. And of course, there will always be a new challenge, a new failure, a new whatever. But when it's recycled back into this process of creativity, through this other process of curiosity, observation, experimentation, and putting your results somewhere, uh, you really see a process of evolving. And this is, this is personal, you know, this is, this is personal stuff because you aren't good to anything unless you're good to yourself first and you have the self-confidence to be who you are. There are an enormous amount of social distractions that get in the way of this. And it's just common. There's so many people out there. But you've got peer pressure and greed and, and, and power and expectations. And you're in a very defined world that it's like you get stuck on a conveyor belt and you can't get off. And to be yourself, you have to get off. You have to get off of that conveyor belt to look at yourself on the planet. And for me, what helps with that is absolutely being in awe of flying through the universe on a chunk of rock through infinity at unbelievable speeds. And that can be kind of disconcerting. 
<laughs> but when you consider that you are a piece of infinity, there's some comfort in that. And there must be some method to this madness or whatever. It's not really madness. It's just a term. But once you feel comfortable with being in an infinite, infinite space, you can then become a much more responsible human being on the planet. You will look at your materials and, I don't know, everything, your environment, you'll look at this entirely different. It's everybody's responsibility to have this personal thought. Everybody would be more sensitive to this if they really looked at it. Now, and that, you know, this is what I see. Back to some of my influences, and a lot of them what has been through nature. And nature can be brutal, and it can be very gentle at the same time. And it's influenced my work amazingly. And how I do what I do, work like this, is... I get a blueprint in my head, or a doodle, or I don't know what I, you know, it just comes to me. It's a mental shape, nothing to do with physics. And then I had to figure out how to take that mental image and turn it into a physical shape. And my basic procedure is I'll just automatically be drawn to the studio and I will grab some industrial materials that feel right to me. You know, it's not anything specific, but it has to like feel right to me. And I'll get them out and I'll cut pieces up, little pieces. And I take these pieces referring to my mental blueprint all the time and I'm shuffling these things around until they start showing the same blueprint I have in my head. And there may be a little difference in how it works just because of the physical materials. But, you know, this thing keeps taking shape. I mean, it takes six weeks to build one of these. And uh, it, it's kind of like a Ouija board. You don't know, it's just you're, you're moving and, you know, you aren't even looking at it sometimes. And then it, there it is. So you weld it together, an enormous amount of finish work, and it ends up being a completed uh, three-piece geometric kinetic sculpture. This particular piece I even got awards for in 2013 uh, at the Cody Museum. They gave me the honored artist status for a year. And then uh, I also got the William Weiss Purchase Award, and the museum actually bought the piece and put it in the museum. Now that confounded me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what to do with that, it, because this is a very abstract thing, how this happens. And, and, and once you sell a piece, it's a very political thing, which I don't deal with very gracefully. but. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, some of the other uh, sculptures that I've done, you know, I've done plenty of them, but it shows the influence I've had from nature and the design. Some of these, are they're anywhere between three and eight feet tall. There's quite a few different uh, pieces that I've done over the years. And uh, it's just a matter, like I said, it's this blueprint that comes in my head. I don't know what I'm doing tomorrow. You know, I've been doing this since forever. I've never had an eight to five job. This is what I've done. And it's basically through this thinking process of just being able to absorb naturally my environment. And I am a translator. I don't know if I'm an artist or not, but I'm the medium that makes this physical, which to me is a total religious experience. <laughs> but, you know, I can do this every day. Like I said, they take a month to six weeks to build. 
And I can get a little bored with that, so I do maybe a half a dozen different types of sculpture. And here's a few other ones. It keeps me sane, where I, I never stop working, basically. This was a project through Terry Lee that uh, we got at the airport. It's a 20-foot long buffalo uh, memorial for Bruce Putnam. And uh, oh, that's Adolphus Bush's piece for his Missouri beer place. <laughs> <laughs> But as you can see, they're all very different. This piece is made out of scraps. I do a lot of recycling of materials. And each one is a challenge in its own. I never know what to expect. I start from square one every time with that creative process thing of the curious, you know, the all the way to the experimentation, and it's different every time. Now, materials, steel is basically the same a lot, but anyway, I love what I do, and it's different. There's a piece at the yam that blows around, it's kind of a humorous piece. I do a fair amount of wind pieces. And then I also do whimsical pieces that are, <laughs> You're probably familiar with this guy. He's the creature, the snow god. Kids come by and sing and dance and bow around him, whatever. <laughs> or I have a 10-foot flying saucer in my backyard with aliens doing experiments. Or I have bad hair day, you know? <laughs> but anyhow, this... Humorous work binds people. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, or black or white. It's you all look at it the same. What's that? <laughs> and uh, so it's a very broad range of things that I'm doing. And I've got 5,000 pieces all over the world. And none of uh, this is all from the trial and error method. No education. Pound your thumb, learn something. And my biggest statement is, uh, my lifestyle is my real art, and everything else is a byproduct. Thank you. <laughs>